Hi everyone, it's Peter, and uh, today I want to talk a little bit about um, the Italian Baroque with specific reference to John Lorenzo Bernini. Um, uh, Bernini is a pretty central character in the 17th century, uh, dates 1598 uh, to 1680. A good comparison uh, in some regards would be with um, uh, Michelangelo in the previous century. His stamp on uh, the city of Rome from his work in the, uh, <clears throat> in the 17th century is, is pretty unmistakable. What I want to focus on uh, has primarily to do uh, with his work in sculpture and um, architecture. Um, before we go there, I want to fill in a little bit of background um, regarding why his work uh, looks the way it does and, and basically why it functions uh, the way it does. For starters, we just need a quick uh, discussion of the word Baroque, uh, especially in regard to the Italian Baroque. This is an art historical term um, that is complicated in a number of ways. First of all, it its origins are a little bit unclear. Um, it's not entirely uh, straightforward why the word Baroque even exists or where it came from, say, in comparison to the word Renaissance. It um, also can stand for a number of different qualities in a work of art. And so efforts to really kind of come up with a, a unified understanding of the word Baroque naturally run into exceptions. In the case of the Italian Baroque, um, the two main directions are kind of an expressive and a classical mode. Um, the expressive mode really is in many ways where um, Bernini's coming from, and as we'll see uh, shortly, uh, Caravaggio as well. Um, and one of the critical things to remember in the 17th century is the degree to which uh, the Catholic Church, having uh, tried to respond to the challenges of the Protestant Reformation, which has been, you know, started in basically Germany since the early decades of the 16th century, um, one of the ways in which they wanted to respond uh, to the challenges of the Reformation is in essence create a religious experience that's much more um, inclusive, emotional, uh, better designed to instill a spirit of devotion and piety uh, in members of the church. And this is going to be particularly effective in uh, the regions of Italy and Spain. Uh, the, the understanding of the Baroque in France, for instance, is, uh, as we'll see, uh, leaning much more toward the classical uh, style, the rational and, and composed as opposed, to, um, as opposed to Bernini, for instance. So the church is uh, doing a number of things, especially following uh, the Council of Trent, uh, which ends in uh, 1563. Um, doing a number of things to try to instill this more reverential and enthusiastic uh, participation in, in the church. So a number of important things begin to emerge uh, from uh, the art world in response to this. Um, the Council of Trent's um, kind of decrees uh, regarding art are, can be summed up in, in essence along the following lines. We, we want art to be um, orthodox uh, that we want it to be legible, we want it to be appropriate. So decorum, the right way to represent subject matter. So the Madonna, the long neck is a non-starter, uh, pretty much going uh, forward. Mannerism and all its peculiarities are, uh, it's not gonna have us as enthusiastic a reception um, uh, anymore. Um, the focus on uh, grand building projects uh, pretty much reaches its culmination in the renovations of uh, the 16th century beginnings of St. Peter's in Rome and a, a, a vast uh, interior and expansion particularly toward um, uh, toward the entrance toward the east uh, with the likes of Carlo Maderno's uh, facade uh, indicates a taste uh, in the 17th century for a much more grandiose and expansive and ultimately expressive vision of um, uh, of architecture and, and by inference um, sculpture as well. 
So um, toward that, um, you know, or I should say contributing to that sense of expansion in St. Peter's, uh, Bernini uh, devises the spectacular piazza. And it's a really good example of uh, the Baroque spirit, if you will, in architecture for a number of reasons. One is the scale, and, and scale is a, is a big thing, definitely, and um, as a, a kind of indicator of the Baroque in action. Um, the uh, piazza is also composed of irregular uh, shapes, so ovals and diagonals uh, dominate that, not the relatively regularized and symmetrical shapes of a typical uh, central plan uh, structure like for instance Michelangelo's uh, original plans for St. Peter's and, and many others of the of that time uh, from the likes of Bramante and so forth. So you have these vast uh, spaces uh, encompassed with irregular shapes with a kind of expressive uh, idea behind them. Bernini himself described um, the piazza as a kind of metaphorical motif like the arms of Mother Church embracing the faithful, uh, which indeed was the purpose of both the facade and the piazza to provide a literal theater for um, uh, for the Pope in making addresses uh, to the city and, and to the world as the phrase has it, uh, Orbi et Orbi. Um, Bernini uh, steps into this uh, process of renovation and expansion with quite a spectacular uh, uh, first uh, project. The Piazza comes along quite a bit later in the in the uh, 1650s uh, with his famous Baldacchino, B-A-L-D-A-C-C-H-I-N-O. The Baldacchino in essence is a kind of a covering for the uh, altar area in St. Peter's and it's huge. Uh, the size uh, of it is on an almost um, superhuman scale, especially for interior architecture, standing uh, close to 100 feet high. Um, it marks uh, not merely the altar, but the uh, reputed grave of the tomb of St. Peter beneath it, and stands out in this vast, and again the cliche of cavernous is certainly appropriate for the interior of uh, St. Peter's. It serves as a kind of marker uh, and also framing uh, the uh, area behind the altar with the spectacular Cathedra Petri uh, itself and another later work uh, by Bernini. The lack of regularity in any architectural or even sculptural sense is pretty profound and another uh, attribute of the Baroque uh, uh, introduces itself here. Kind of, uh, we also saw this a little bit in the piazza, but the sculptural quality, that, that is the way in which uh, the artist Bernini uh, integrates sculptural uh, forms into the actual structure itself, as well as considerable uh, sculptural decoration that adorns uh, the whole uh, structure. Um, moving on to uh, Bernini's uh, sculpture more specifically, um, one of the most classic examples really of the Baroque um, at this point in time is going to be uh, Bernini's uh, David from 1623. Uh, much like uh, Michelangelo's uh, David of uh, 1504, this sculpture in many ways really sits as a, a classic representation of ideas of art in its time. And I think there's little doubt that Bernini's uh, sculpture is in a very real sense a response uh, to Michelangelo's work of 1504. Michelangelo, of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, has left his stamp on Rome in any number of ways, um, and most spectacularly in terms of an early work of art, uh, the Pietà uh, that we've looked at. But in the case of the David, the, con uh, the contrast or comparison with the Florentine David of 1504 is instructive in thinking of differing artistic priorities. Uh, particularly important is the aspect of movement. Uh, the sense in um, Michelangelo of potential movement that is stalled or suffocated or halted for uh, reasons that are not immediately apparent, um, that's resolved in Bernini. The David of Bernini is coiled up, wound up, 
you know, actually ready for action, in action, uh, perhaps is even a better way of putting it. He's committed, he's engaged, he is not uh, merely surveying uh, the situation. The David uh, Bernini is actually life-size and probably intended for presentation in such a way that a viewer can go around it and see multiple vantage points, uh, multiple perspectives um, at, uh, you know, uh, maybe not exactly the same time, but it's a kind of continuous process. And it's pretty clear from the way that Michelangelo presents his day, but that it's intended to be seen from one side, uh, that is to say from the front, that um, it's not intended to be seen as uh, possessing much in the way of, of, of potential movement, uh, the way that, that Bernini uh, does. Bernini's David is psychologically intense, the biting of the lip, the the uh, furrowed brow, the focus uh, as he uh, winds up to throw that stone. Um, so there's psychological intensity, um, the dramatic and dynamic quality uh, that's, uh, that this sculpture possesses is certainly a classic instance of Italian, Italian Baroque. Another example of psychological intensity and a dramatic presentation, perhaps the, the greatest example that Bernini comes up with is in his Ecstasy of St. Teresa, 1645 to 52. In this uh, chapel, so a chapel within a church, uh, Santa Maria della Vittoria, he um, basically blends together uh, uh, architecture and sculpture, especially in a kind of spectacular, uh, deliberately theatrical uh, setting. St. Teresa of Avila, the subject of the central sculpture, is a well-known uh, 16th century, recently canonized female saint whose fame, uh, uh, especially for this artistic piece, depends primarily on a series of mystical visions uh, that she wrote about. Mysticism, it's worth remembering, is the kind of direct apprehension, perception of the divine through the senses. And she describes in one of her uh, uh, um, writings the visitation by an angel who pierces her body uh, with an arrow. Bernini shows her at this moment uh, in a very um, psychologically intense uh, way, uh, one that's probably closer to sexual ecstasy than religious ecstasy, but for mystics that line is often uh, blurred, and I think deliberately is so by Bernini. Her body uh, is of course hidden under a mass of extraordinarily complex folded drapery, but the expression on her face and the sort of languid posture of her hands and feet indicate uh, again a kind of overall intensity of emotion that uh, certainly a sculptor in the 16th century wouldn't have uh, uh, dared attempt or a patron uh, would have tolerated. The connection uh, of theater, emotion, uh, drama um, is, I think, uh, perhaps enhanced in the religious sense by uh, the texts which any devout Catholic probably would have been aware of by the time uh, Bernini creates uh, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa, and that is uh, his book, The Spiritual Exercises. The Spiritual Exercises uh, are as, as basically all, kind of like a series of meditations. Um, Ignatius Loyola, a former soldier and then founder of the Jesuit order, created a series of um, scenarios, the worshiper, the devout Catholic, is invited to contemplate him or herself in certain places or situations, such as, for example, uh, what is hell like? And he uh, basically involves the reader in this process by asking the reader to imagine what the sounds and sights and smells and, and, and uh, sensations, touch sensations, would be of hell to sort of more vividly uh, create that uh, in in the mind. And so art uh, that was, um, uh, you know, in Rome at this point in time, uh, explicitly or implicitly, uh, I think typically tended, again, Bernini is the primary ex exponent of this, tended to play upon uh, the viewer's uh, senses to suggest uh, through whatever means possible uh, physical, bodily, corporeal effects. 
uh, not merely abstract intellectual ones such as we might be more likely to see uh, in uh, say the 15th century or even into uh, the 16th century. So Bernini's effects on uh, the city fabric of the time are pretty considerable, whether it's through the piazza and St. Peter's, numerous fountains uh, distributed throughout the city, uh, are other examples of architecture, um, things like uh, the Cornaro Chapel or even on a smaller scale, the sculpture such as that of uh, the David, he really helps uh, to define and understand uh, the Italian Baroque. 